Αγαπητοί τηλεθεατέ του Hellenic TV, καλησπέρα σα. Ακόμα μια εκπομπή Ομογένεια εδώ Λονδίνο ξεκινά και θα είναι μαζί σα για την επόμενη ώρα. Όπω κάθε φορά, έτσι και απόψε, θα σα παρουσιάσουμε τι πιο πρόσφατε εκδηλώσει τη παροικία. Πριν όμω ξεκινήσουμε, να σα αναφέρουμε ότι μέσα από την εκπομπή μα μπορείτε να παρουσιάζετε τι δικέ σα εκδηλώσει και να προβάλλετε τον οργανισμό ή την επιχείρησή σα. Για περισσότερες πληροφορίες μπορείτε να επικοινωνήσετε μαζί μας στο τηλέφωνο του Hellenic TV 020 8292 7037 ή στην ηλεκτρονική μας διεύθυνση info at hellenictv.net. Απόψε θα δείτε τη συζήτηση που έγινε στη Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων με θέματα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα καθώς και ένα απόσπασμα από τη συνέντευξη του ελληνοαμερικανού δικηγόρου Αθανάσιο Τσιμπίδη που έδωσε πρόσφατα στο Hellenic TV. Τέλο, θα δείτε το Χριστουγεννιάτικο Παζαράκι που διοργάνωσε ο Σύνδεσμο Γυναικών Αγγλία στο Κυπριακό Κοινοτικό Κέντρο στο Wood Green. Με αφορμή την Παγκόσμια ημέρα των Ανθρωπίνων Δικαιωμάτων, τα έντιμα μέλη τη Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων Jim Sheridan και Andy Love, η κυρία Τηγόνη Παπαδοπούλου από το Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοβούλιο με τη συνεργασία τη Φοιτητική Παράταξη Αναγέννηση Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου, διοργάνωσαν την 4η-7 Δεκεμβρίου πολιτική εκδήλωση στην Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων. Θέμα της εκδήλωσης ήταν τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα και η υπόθεση της Κύπρου και συζητήθηκε το δράμα των αγνοουμένων καθώς και ο σφετερισμός στην κατεχόμενη Κύπρο. Την εκδήλωση τίμησαν με την παρουσία τους ο Κύπριος Ήπατος Αρμοστής κ. Αλέξανδρο Ζήνων, αντιπρόσωποι της Εθνικής Κυπριακής Ομοσπονδίας, εκπρόσωποι συνδέσμων και κομμάτων της παροικίας και αρκετοί φοιτητέ. Την έναρξη της σημαντικής συζήτησης έκανε ο Βρετανός βουλευτής Τζιμ Σέριντα total disarray, um, but hopefully we'll make progress. Just by way of introduction, my name is Jim Sheridan, Member of Parliament for a place called Paisley, which is in Scotland, um, and I'm a proud member of the all-party Cyprus group, and we certainly work as a collective group to try and promote the best interests um, of Cyprus, uh, and hopefully we can do that in a clear and constructive way. I know there are some other people who are coming, they're on their way and they're stuck at Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square, uh, but they will be here soon. Uh, we have Andy Love. Uh, Andy is also a member of the all-party group on Cyprus. Um, and Andy will be saying a few words, but he has to go early doors because he's got another, um, another appointment. But tonight's meeting is about, it's about your meeting. It's about looking at the whole situation of human rights in Cyprus and the importance of human rights in Cyprus. Some of us have been out and seen some of the atrocities out there in terms of the sacred places that's been desecrated by vandalism. And I think that's the only word that I can think of using. Um, so we can clearly understand the problems that you're facing and the challenges that face you as a country ahead. So. Without further ado, can we just ask Andy to say a few words um, in terms of where we, as a parliamentary group, are going and how we see the challenges developing um, over the next few months and the next few years, perhaps. Στη συνέχεια, σύντομο χαιρετισμό έκανε και ο γνωστός φίλος Βρετανός βουλευτής των εργατικών, Andy Love. Well, Jim, uh, this wouldn't be the first meeting that either you or I have attended where we were in disarray in terms of the organisation, and I have to say. It's always good to come to meetings with the Cypriot community because the level of interest and commitment and contact and energy that you see and uh, we're very pleased to see so many people here. It doesn't surprise me in the slightest because I know just how close to everyone's uh, priorities of concern the Cyprus issue is. It's also very good to be here. I had uh, originally not intended uh, to speak at all. Uh, that's an impossibility at Cyprus meetings. Uh, but to come along and to reacquaint myself with Antigone, who I first met when she was a mayor of Morfu, but who has uh, graduated onto an international stage in the European Parliament. I'm very pleased to see her again, and I hope that she'll be able to speak with great authority as a European parliamentarian, but perhaps more importantly, as someone who's had to live through the experience of the division of the island and to be separated uh, from her uh, village, her home, and uh, uh, the ability to be able to return 
and to have all of the privileges and uh, 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 rights that uh, every other European Union country uh, uh, has as part of their uh, commitment and involvement and membership of the European Union. I, I just wanted to say two things, and uh, I, I do apologise for repeating uh, myself, because I know many of you will have heard a lot of this before, uh, but I say it because it's important and because it's true. The first is that Cyprus has many, many friends in the British Parliament. It has many friends against, uh, amongst former uh, parliamentarians. Uh, uh, it is, as an issue, raised on a very regular basis. I had the opportunity uh, to question the Foreign Secretary last week uh, here in Parliament, and I asked him uh, the question that I suspect is all on your lips, uh, which is, what more, and with an emphasis on the word more, what more uh, will the Foreign Office do to raise Cyprus up the international agenda? And following what we were told was a very successful visit of the President of Turkey, how important did they consider uh, an invitation to the President of Cyprus to come to London uh, to uh, speak with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary about the Cypriot view on the negotiating process and how we move things forward? And I think those are two priorities. I know that my other colleagues who are probably not would be with you this evening, but I think I can speak on their behalf uh, when I say they are and continue to be committed. Two other members, uh, both on the Conservative side, raised questions also with the Foreign Secretary uh, and made it clear to him that there is widespread cross-party support for uh, doing more to try and uh, engage with the Cyprus issue and try and take the negotiating process in a more positive direction than it's be, been in, the, in recent months. And I know that there, are, there is a meeting coming up in, uh, in the United States in the new year and we are focusing our attention on that. So the first thing I wanted to say was how important it is that we link in the, the members of parliament are reflecting the concerns and the ambitions uh, of the Cypriot community. And I think we are doing that, although, as always, we could do more. And I'm acutely aware that we all could be doing more, but the most important thing is that we communicate that to the government, that no matter how well they think they are doing, they have to be doing more uh, uh, on the issue of Cyprus. Uh, the second uh, issue I just wanted to touch upon, and I look around this room and it's a reflection. I recognise lots of people in here. I've had contact with them over the years. I consider many Cypriots who live in my constituency not just to be constituents, but to be personal friends. I came to London, uh, and I'm showing my age now, but I came to London in 1974. I came with a lot of other people, although I was from Scotland, they were from Cyprus. So I've been aware of the issue. I was a councillor in Haringey, which of course at that time, this is going back into the 1980s, was probably the premier residence of Cypriots. As Cypriots have moved from the 40s and 50s in Camden and Islington to the 70s and 80s in Haringey to the 90s and 2000s, in Enfield and now in the new century probably uh, moving westwards towards Barnet. I've in a sense followed you because I started out in Islington. I lived for many years in Haringey. I now reside in Enfield. I don't think I'm going to Barnet. I'm sorry <laughs> for all of you who live in Barnet. I shan't be following you there. I can't afford it apart from anything else but I, I, I feel in essence a part of the Cypriot community. 
I've lived amongst them, my neighbours, as well as my friends and as well as my constituents as Cypriots. And I can assure you, even just elderly Cypriots who casually meet you uh, on the street or in the shops will always mention Cyprus. What are you doing about Cyprus? It's almost the second question. The first question is always, how's your family? You've heard that before. And the second question is, what are you doing on Cyprus? And I think that reflects the serious issues that are of great concern to the Cypriot community. Uh, so I and I've been very fortunate to have many Cypriots as friends. I look on you as a very important part. Uh, I have got roughly, roughly the same number of Turkish Cypriots as I have Greek Cypriots. Uh, so Cyprus, the two different perspectives uh, are very much there in my constituency. And I can tell you uh, from experience over all those years, if it was left to those two communities, we would have solved this a long time ago. I can tell you of the real concerns there is amongst the Turkish Cypriot community that they're going to disappear entirely from the island of Cyprus. I can tell you about the desire of many of them to return, but the circumstances that they face in the north of Cyprus are very, very difficult. So there is a strong will to find a solution on both sides, and if that was the way it was going forward. So we all have to recognise where the difficulties lie, where the problems with finding a solution lie, and that's why, and I will finish on this, that's why it's so important that the international community plays a more prominent role, because it is with the guarantor powers and with uh, Turkey in particular that we need to engage in order to find a solution. And there was an opportunity uh, when uh, President Gould came to uh, London, there will be future opportunities, but we need to be making sure that not only the international community, but the British, the UK voice speaks up loudly. We have a very large Cypriot estimates it range anywhere from 300 to 500,000 Cypriots. We're, we're almost getting to the population of the island here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and we need to be speaking up on behalf of all of those people to say, uh, this has gone on far, far too long. We need to have a negotiating process that will deliver uh, a, a solution that both communities can vote upon and support because that's the birthright of every Cypriot. Ο πρόεδρος της φοιτητικής παράταξης Αναγέννηση Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου Κωνσταντίνος Γιάγκου έκανε μια σύντομη ομιλία. And the Honorable Baba Dobulu and Mary Hannibal, and the President of the National Federation of Cypriots in the UK, Mr. Drushotis, for co organizing the Human Rights, the Case of Cyprus discussion with our student union and agency. Secondly, I would like to welcome you all to the House of Commons for a fully cons constructive and interesting afternoon. The Cyprus issue is definitely a case of systematic, documented gross human rights violations. During and in the aftermath of Turkey's 1974 unlawful invasion of the Republic of Cyprus, Turkey breached a plethora of human rights and fundamental freedoms and showed a flagrant disregard and disrespect for European community and international law principles. Among others, Turkey forcefully evicted and displaced people from their homes and land, ex expropriated and usurped Cypriot properties, systematically despoil and vandalize the Cypriot cultural heritage and cause the missing of 1619 people, a number which is overwhelming if considered in proportion to the population of Cyprus at the time of the invention. For an agency, the continuation of the struggle carried by our people against the occupation of our land is not an option but an obligation. 
patience and perseverance are essential weapons in this effort. We reaffirm our faith in the inter temporal principles and we emphasize our readiness to continue the effort for freedom. We have the utmost belief that the Cypriot people, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, are entitled to live in a common state with security, peace, and freedom and democracy. Η Ευρωβουλευτή του Δημοκρατικού Κόμματο, κυρία Αντιγόνη Παπαδοπούλου, η οποία παρευρέθη στο Λονδίνο ειδικά για αυτή την εκδήλωση, έκανε μια αναλυτική παρουσίαση με θέμα τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα. Α δούμε ένα μικρό απόσπασμα από την παρουσίαση. I am very thankful because the Student Union Anagenesis, which belongs to the Democratic Party in Cyprus, invite me to come here and deliver a speech on the human rights, the case of Cyprus, as a member of the European Parliament but also as a refugee coming from Morfu, who has been uh, striving very hard since 1974 for the day that the island will be reunited and we refugees will be able to return back to Kyrenia, to Famagusta, to so many hundreds of uh, communities, villages and towns who are under Turkish occupation for the last 37 years. This event is a sponsor, is a, um, is uh, being organized in association with Peter Drusodis, the National Federation of Cypriots. Unfortunately, he cannot be here, but he has a representative who is going to speak later on in this meeting. And immediately after me, you are the next speaker. And uh, of course, I must say that uh, it is organized on the occasion of the 10th of December, because as we know, the 10th of December is the international declaration of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The United uh, Nations General Assembly adopted and proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the 10th of December 1948. That was a historical act because a common standard of, for all the peoples of all nations uh, was set up to promote respect for rights and freedoms, to secure their universal recognition. And today, 63, 64 years after, it is worth worth remembering some of these uh, articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are entitled to be born free, equal in dignity and rights, article number one. All rights, freedoms without distinctions, article number two. They should really have a happy life, liberty, security, article number three. Not to be held in slavery, article number four not to be subjected to torture, inhuman degrading treatment or punishment, article number five. And it goes on and on, listing all these rights which every citizen of the world should be uh, free to enjoy. Freedom of movement and residence, own property, not to be arbitrarily deprived of their property, freedom to work and freedom to education. And this is the same vision that the EU has, the 27 member countries, which are complex societies, but they are united in diversity. And of course, uh, the EU today tries to have a common direction, common principles, common values, common respect of human rights. Unfortunately, besides the economic crisis, there is a crisis in values, because we see that human rights are violated in a lot of parts of the world and also in my country, Cyprus. And this is what we are here to talk about. We know about the Convention of the Human Rights of the European Union, and we know about the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And uh, of course, there are so many chapters about dignity, freedoms, equality, solidarity, citizens' rights, justice, and so many general provisions. The Lisbon Treaty gives the Charter a binding legal effect equal to the treaties, and also the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights guarantees that at least on the papers, the legislation protects all citizens, including European uh, citizens, from all kinds of violations of human rights, and also all people should be equal. This is not the case, however, in Cyprus. And I don't want to make a political speech because very often I say I don't consider myself a politician. I consider myself an active citizen who in 1974 became a refugee. I was 18 years old at the time. Sula was one of my uh, classmates. 
and I see her once every five, six years. Why? Why I cannot go back to Morfu? Why I cannot go back to Kairinya? Why so many people of you are refugees and they have to live in London? London is beautiful to come and visit, but Morfu, Kairinya, and Famagusta are also very beautiful, and we are denied the right to go and visit our place unless we have a passport. And this is unbelievable in the 21st century. And this is unbelievable for me because I am a member of the European Parliament. I can travel everywhere. And when I say I'm a member of the European Parliament, all the doors are open. There is a red carpet, and everybody says, go ahead. But if I want to go to my, to my village, to my town, Morfu, which is now called Gusel Yurt, I have to show a passport. And believe me, this is a severe violation of my right as a European citizen to travel freely, to work freely, to decide where I want to stay. And I want to stay, believe me, not in Brussels. I want to stay in Morfu. And I want to visit London. And I want to visit Brussels. And I want to work in Morfu. And this is a big problem. And this is denied for the people from the Carpas Peninsula. It is denied for the people from Agathu. It is denied for the people of Lisi and for so many occupied municipalities. We have nine occupied municipalities. And I used, I used to be the mayor, and I know that all the mayors of these nine municipalities speak with the same language. They have the same demands. And we are not happy because 37 years, we used to be very young boys and girls, like the colleagues we have here from Anagenesis. And for the last 37 years, we grew up, and this violation of human rights, unfortunately, continues. Why? So I said that I am an active citizen. I decided to show you some paintings. These paintings are by well-known Cypriot artists that speak from themselves. They recount in visual form the tragedy of the Cypriot people, resulting from the denial of their human rights. They reveal the whole story of what happened. And we don't need a lot of words. Just see the pictures as these painters have made them. Human rights, the case of Cyprus, 1974. A Turkish aggressive behavior resulted in a Turkish invasion. 37% of the island came under occupation. More than 170,000 people, refugees. Some 1,500 Greek Cypriots missing. Some 20,000 Greek Cypriots in the occupied area were enclaved. And because of ethnic cleansing, these people now are gone. They live either in England, they live in Australia, they live everywhere else, but not in the Carpas Peninsula. Only 300 or 400 people are still there. More than 115, nobody knows how many illegal settlers are now on the island. Because nobody, Turkey is not accountable for this illegal settling which takes place during the last 37 years. And of course, we have so many United Nations, European Court of Human Rights resolutions, mm -hmm. and other resolutions from international organizations which condemned the Turkish invasion, but they are, they are unfortunately only on paper. They have not been implemented. And if I am a, a member of the European Parliament, I want to know why there is no a mechanism to implement all these resolutions. Why the Council of Europe does not have a mechanism? Why all this legislative process which takes place is just on paper? Why we don't try? The United Nations cannot implement their United Nations resolutions. The European Court of Human Rights cannot do that. Who can do that? Why we politicians are not able to implement all these things we vote for? Why the international organizations cannot implement their resolutions? This is a very big question. So we have seen that in May 2001, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Turkey had violated 14 articles of the European Convention of Human Rights concerning refugees, enclaved and missing people. And we see it through the paintings, absence of remedies. On the top, you see the European Convention of Human Rights. What the convention says, Article 13, the right to an effective remedy. And down below is the European Court of Human Rights. This has been violated. Article 13 has been violated. There are no remedies. And this was the judgment of the court on Cyprus application, Strasbourg, 10th of May, 2011. 
Αμέσω μετά την παρουσίαση, το λόγο πήραν οι φοιτητέ. Πρώτο μίλησε ο Νεκτάριο Χρυστοδουλίδη. Είμαι ο Νεκτάριο Χρυστοδουλίδη, ένα δεύτερο χρόνο στην Ουνιβέρσιτη του Λέστερ, στο Δεπάρτμεντο τη Λόγω. And I will speak about the missing people, which is one of the major consequences of the Turkish invasion in of 1974. Uh, in the summer of uh, 1974, Turkish troops invaded and occupied more than a third of the territory of the Republic of Cyprus. Over the years, those who lost their beloved, their homes, and their livelihoods have begun the, the painful process of rebounding their shattered lives. But for us, The fathers, the mothers, the brothers, the sisters, and the children of the missing, the passage of time has deepened rather than healed the wounds inflicted by the Turkish invasion. I'm here today talking with a dual role. I'm talking firstly as a young law Cypriot lawyer, but primarily as a first degree relative of missing person. There are about 1,500 missing persons, our relatives. This number includes not only soldiers, but also civilians, and among them human, uh, women and children who disappeared consequent to the Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974. These missing Greek Cypriots were arrested by the Turkish army under the control and command of Turkish armed forces. Subsequent to their arrest, many were transported to Turkey and kept as prisoners in Turkish jails. Since 1974, despite our appeals to the Turkish government and other international organizations, And contrary to international law and the Human Rights Convention, Turkey refuses that to provide us with any information about the fate of our beloved. Instead, the Turkish government insists that it knows nothing about the fate of our relatives and furthermore that no Greek Cypriot is missing. In 1975, the human rights organization Amnesty International presented the Turkish government with a list of 40 missing persons about whom it has complied evidence pointing to their presence in mainland Turkish prisons. No response to Amnesty's demand for an account was ever received uh, from the Turkish government. Turkey is constantly rejecting the effort of humanitarian bodies and blocks attempts by the international communities to investigate the fate of our disappearing relatives. Although a committee on missing persons was set up under the auspices of the United Nations in 1981, the Turkish government is not represented and does not participate in the, pro in the, in the proceedings. It is not therefore surprising that the committee, after so many years of investigation, has failed to determine the fate of the single disappearing person and to inform the family concern accordingly. Uh, the Turkish government, in its refusal to recognize its obligation to account for the fate of Greek Cypriots, had in its custody that is guilty of one of the most heinous crimes against humanity, the crime of enforced disappearance, a crime which is not subject to time limitation. As the verbal report, which was submitted on September 1984 to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe states, enforced disappearance is one of the most serious violations of the human rights safeguarded by international instruments. It infringes virtually on all the victims' personal rights and many of the rights of their families. The violation cannot be justified by special circumstances, whether armed conflicts, state of emergency, or internal unrest or tension. This ongoing crime is a stain of Turkey's international reputation. More importantly, it is a crime which perpetuates the suffering of the missing and their families, a crime which constitutes the most frequent violation of the basic and fundamental human rights of both the missing person and us, their families. Our one and, our one and only demand is a profoundly human being. It is a single demand for the full restoration and respect of the basic and fundamental human rights of the missing persons and of ourselves. Is it too much to ask? Thank you. Το λόγο στη συνέχεια πήρε και ο Κωνσταντίνος Πογιατζής, αντιπρόεδρος της φοιτητικής παράταξης Αναγέννηση. Είμαι ο Κωνσταντίνος Πογιατζής, είμαι ο Vice President of the Student Union uh, Αναγέννησης and I will tell you about the violations of human rights in Cyprus by Turkey the last 37 years. The European Court of Human Rights has given the clear message that Cyprus' issue is primarily an international case based on the violation of human rights and international law by Turkey. The Court has ruled on important issues of international law, traditionally referring to the legal status of the Republic of Cyprus and the illegal actions of Turkey in Cyprus. Basic human rights and vital freedoms, as well as the independence, dominance and territorial dignity of Cyprus, 
were brutally violated by the Turkish military invasion of my country in July 1974. On the 20th of July 1974, <coughs> Turkey invaded Cyprus, an equal member of the United Nations. The Turkish government proclaimed that this action was a peace operation aiming at the restoration of the constitutional order in the island, which was ostensibly distributed by a coup against the legal government of Cyprus. <coughs> According to international law, this is an international crime. Furthermore, Turkey had one-sidedly proclaimed the establishment of a puppet autonomous administration in the occupied part of Cyprus, supported up by the military power of the Turkish occupying forces. Turkey's efforts to establish an autonomous administration in the occupied north of Cyprus was, of course, part of the plan to turn the independent state of the Republic of Cyprus into two different states. Today, Turkey continues to violate human rights as forcible division of the land and its people along ethnic lines. Turkish civilians are given the status of a citizen of a non-existing republic and are considered as being part of the population of an illegal puppet administration <coughs> established by Turkey in the occupied territories of the island. The European Court of Human Rights and the Human Rights Commission of the Council of Europe have established that many crimes were committed in Cyprus by Turkish troops such as cold-blooded murders, rapes, and inhuman treatment. By committing those crimes intentionally and on a mass scale, Turkey is answerable for war crimes and or crimes against humanity. An interview with Mustafa Organ, who was a Turkish soldier at the time of the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, referred to a massive kill of about 100 Greek Cypriot civilians who had fled to a small village of Mora near Nicosia. Those killed at the exit of the village were women, children who were running for their lives, he said. Little streets and the exit areas were full of civilians, children and women who were trying to get away. These people were killed in a most vicious way and some of the bodies were cut into pieces. The Turkish invasion of Cyprus forced approximately one quarter of the Cypriot population to be displaced from their homes and properties situated in the Turkish occupied area of Cyprus. All these persons are still refugees. For so many years, Turkey has refused to comply with the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council resolutions calling for urgent measures to facilitate the voluntary return of all refugees to their homes in safety and to settle all other aspects of the refugees' problems. The fundamental human right of freedom of religion also continues to be violated in Cyprus. <coughs> However, around 575 churches and Christian religious monuments in the occupied areas, along with our cemeteries, have been willfully vandalized, robbed, destroyed, or converted into barracks of the Turkish army. For us, the right solution is a solution that we want to adhere to international law and the basic principles embodying respect for human rights, democracy, and also lasting settlement on this going tragedy. Περισσότερα για την διοργάνωση της εκδήλωσης στην Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων, καθώς και για άλλα θέματα, η Ευρωβουλευτής Αντιγόνη Παπαδοπούλου μίλησε στο Hellenic TV και στο συνάδελφό μας Γιάννη Ιωάννου. Κυρία Αντιγόνη Παπαδοπούλου, καταρχάς καλώς ήρθατε στο Λοδίνο και φαντάζομαι ήρθατε ειδικά για την εκδήλωση από τις Βρυξέλλες απόψε, έτσι. Μάλιστα, ήρθα σήμερα το πρωί από τις Βρυξέλλες γιατί ο στόχος είναι να παρουσιάσουμε ακριβώς τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα, πώς παραβιάζονται στη δική μας πατρίδα στην Κύπρο και είναι πολύ σημαντικό να γίνεται μια τέτοια εκδήλωση, ιδίω αυτές τις μέρες που στις 10 του Δεκέμβρη γιορτάζουμε την 63η επέτειο από την Παγκόσμια Διακήρυξη των Ανθρωπίνων Δικαιωμάτων, του Οργ 
ΟΕΕ. Όπω γνωρίζετε, είναι το όραμα τη Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση αλλά και των παγκόσμιων οργανισμών να υπάρχει σεβασμό στα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα. Ε, λοιπόν, αυτά τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα στη δική μα πατρίδα καταπιέζονται και παραβιάζονται τα τελευταία 37 χρόνια από την Τουρκία. Είναι το δικαίωμα των προσφύγων, το οποίο παραβιάζεται, το δικαίωμα του να ζουν στη γη που γεννήθηκαν, το δικαίωμα μα να ζούμε σε μια πατρίδα όπου να μπορούμε να εργαστούμε όπου θέλουμε, να διακινούμαστε ελεύθερα, χωρί διαβατήριο και οπωσδήποτε τα δικαιώματα των αγνοωμένων μα, γιατί οι συγγενεί του εδώ και 37 χρόνια προσπαθούν να μάθουν τι απέγινα. Είναι τα δικαιώματα των εγκλωβισμένων μα, διότι έχουν υποστεί εθνική κάθαρση τα τελευταία 37 χρόνια και οπωσδήποτε το μίασμα τη κατοχή. Το να βλέπει τη σημεία στο, στο σκλαβωμένο πεντατάκτυλο, τη σημεία τη Τουρκία και να βλέπει κάθε μέρα την πρόκληση διαβάζοντα το ότι πρέπει να είσαι περήφανο γιατί γεννήθηκε Τούρκο, νομίζω ότι αυτό συνιστά μια ανήβρη γιατί ω Ευρωπαίοι πολίτε δεχόμαστε κατάφατσα την ε, προσβολή και το μίασμα τη κατοχή. Και η παρουσία μου εδώ είναι ακριβώ για να επιθυμήσει και στο Αγγλικό Κοινοβούλιο, όπω κάναμε χθε και στο Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοβούλιο, ότι έχουμε και εμεί οι Κύπροι δικαιώματα και δεν είμαστε κατηγορία δεύτερη. Είμαστε και εμεί Ευρωπαίοι πολίτε που έχουμε και υποχρεώσει αλλά και δικαιώματα όπω κάθε Ευρωπαίο πολίτη. Κύριε Παπαδοπούλου, πόσο σημαντική βρήκατε και επικοδομητική την αποψήνη συζήτηση σχετικά με την Κυπριακό και με την κρίσιμη περίοδο που βρίσκεται εκεί προ σήμερα. Θεωρώ ότι είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντική αυτή η δικτύωση. Ε, πάντα πίστευα ότι ο απόδειμο ε, κυπριακό ελληνισμό, αλλά και ο ελληνισμό γενικότερα, πάντα ζει στο εξωτερικό όταν είναι υποχρεωμένο να ζει στο εξωτερικό και το μυαλό του είναι στην πατρίδα. Με την οικονομική κρίση στην Ελλάδα και με την πολιτική κρίση που υπάρχει διαρκώ στην Κύπρο, λόγω του άλλου του κυπριακού προβλήματο, αλλά και των πολλαπλών εκφοβισμών που αυτή τη στιγμή εξασκεί η Τουρκία εναντίον τη χώρα μου. Γιατί ακριβώ αποφάσισε να κάνει προσπάθεια για να βρει υδρογονάθρακε στη δική μα αποκλειστική οικονομική ζώνη. Ε, με όλα αυτά τα οποία συμβαίνουν γύρω μα, πιστεύω ότι ο ρόλο μα εμά των Ευρωβουλευτών είναι να ακούμε τον παλμό του κόσμου και το απόδειμου κυπριακού ελληνισμού και να γεφυρώνουμε το χάσμα ανάμεσα στι Βρυξέλλε, στον χώρο όπου βρίσκεται ο απόδειμο ελληνισμό και τη Λευκοσία. Και νομίζω ότι είναι υποχρέωση. Μας. Αυτό ακριβώ έκανα απόψε να έρθω να ακούσω τον Παλμό πώ σκέφτονται οι αποδείμοι μα και τολμώ να πω ότι υπάρχει μια σύμπλευση απόψεων γιατί έχω δει μια νομοθυμία στο να βρεθεί μια σωστή και δίκαιη λύση χωρί παρεκκλήσει όσον αφορά το ευρωπαϊκό κεκτημένο που να διασφαλίζει τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα όλων στην Κύπρο και γι' αυτό πρέπει να παλέψουμε. Μα έχετε αναφέρει στη συζήτηση ότι. Τελευταίω, έχετε κάνει μια εκδήλωση στο Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοβούλιο σχετικά για την Κύπρο. Με ποιου άλλου τρόπου το Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοβούλιο θα μπορούσε να υποστηρίξει το πρόβλημα τη Κύπρου και αμέσω να γίνει η άμεση ε, παρουσίαση του κυπριακού προβλήματο και στο εξωτερικό, στο Κοινοβούλιο. Ε, πάντα έχω μια αρχή. Εγώ πιστεύω στα τρία δέλτα. Δικτύωση, διαφώτιση, διεκδίκηση. Είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό καθημερινά και εμεί που είμαστε ενεργοί πολίτε και πολιτικοί να ενημερώνουμε ξένου βουλευτέ από όποια χώρα και αν προέρχονται για το κυπριακό πρόβλημα. Η διαφώτιση είναι άμεση και πρέπει, χρειάζεται. Είναι κάτι το πολύ σημαντικό που πρέπει να γίνεται καθημερινά. Και μάλιστα θα έπρεπε αυτή η διαφώτιση να μπει κάτω από μια ομπρέλα, ούτω ώστε και οι δήμαρχοι των κατεχωμένων πόλεων, αλλά και οι πρόσφυγε και οι μη κυβερνητικέ οργανώσει και η εκτελεστική εξουσία και οι εκλελεγμένοι, είτε είναι διορισμένοι υπουργοί είτε εκλελεγμένοι βουλευτέ, να μιλούν την ίδια γλώσσα και να εκπέμπουν τα ίδια μηνύματα διαφώτιση. Όσον αφορά τη δικτύωση, η δουλειά μα πρέπει να είναι να δικτυωνόμαστε διαρκώ και με άλλου πολιτικού, για να μπορούν ακριβώ να ακούν τη φωνή μα και να είναι συνεργοί στην προσπάθεια για εξέπρεση μια σωστή και δίκαιη λύση. Και το πιο σημαντικό για μένα είναι η διεκδίκηση γιατί με την πολιτική του καλού παιδιού δεν πάμε πουθενά. Εκείνο που χρειάζεται είναι να πιστούν οι άλλοι ότι ναι έχουμε το δίκαιο με το μέρος μας αλλά σύν Αθηνά και χειρακίνη ότι πρέπει και εμείς να διεκδικούμε πιο πολύ, να μην είμαστε απλά οι καλοί μαθητές γιατί ορίστε πήραμε, είμαστε οι πρώτοι μαθητές για την Ευρωζώνη αλλά τώρα η οικονομία μας έχει προβλήματα ενώ εάν εμεί διεκδικούμε στο πολιτικό στο οικονομικό θέμα σε όλα τα θέματα το δίκαιο μας 
Πιστεύω ότι και οι άλλοι θα μα σεβαστούν, γιατί λαοί που δεν διεκδικούν το δίκαιο του, στο τέλο χάνουν. Αρκούνται με τα ψίχουλα τον ισχυρό και εμεί δεν πρέπει να αρκεστούμε με ψίχουλα. Και κλείνοντα, απόψε η συμμετοχή των μπάρικων αλλά και των φοιτητών ήταν πάρα πολύ μεγάλη. Πώ βλέπετε τη σημαντική αυτή παρουσία των φοιτητών που σπουδάζουν στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο και πώ αυτό γίνεται συνάμα με την άμεση προβολή του Κυπριακού προβλήματο στο εξωτερικό. Θεωρώ ότι είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό η νεολαία μα να είναι στην πρώτη γραμμή. Χαίρομαι γιατί τα παιδιά τη Αναγέννηση, που είναι τα παιδιά που σπουδάζουν εδώ, οι Κύπροι φοιτητέ που ανήκουν στο Δημοκρατικό Κόμμα, έδωσαν την ψυχή του. Ξέρω ότι δούλεψαν περίπου τον τελευταίο μήνα πολύ σκληρά για να φέρουν φοιτητέ από όλε τι πόλει, από τον Μπέρμιχαμ, τον Νότιχαμ και το Λονδίνο, Βόρειο Λονδίνο και άλλε περιοχέ. Του συγχαίρω γιατί πραγματικά πάντα πίστευα ότι οι σκητάλοι πρέπει να πηγαίνουν. Από τη μια γενιά στην άλλη και στην πρωτοπορία να είναι πάντα οι νέοι που έχουν σφίγο, έχουν ορμή, έχουν όρεξη και πρωτίστω πρέπει να έχουν και όνειρα. Πρέπει να ζουν και να ονειρεύονται. Ότι αυτά τα οποία του αφήνει η παλαιότερη γενιά δεν είναι, πρέπει να είναι ερήπια. Πρέπει να είναι ελπιδοφόρα τα μηνύματα που πρέπει να αφήσει η παλιά γενιά στου νέου και να τολμήσουν οι νέοι να πάρουν τη ζωή στα χέρια του, να παλέψουν. Διότι η ζωή είναι αγώνα. Και πράγματι απόψε είδα αυτόν τον Φρίγο και την ορμή, να διοχετεύεται σε πολύ ωραίε ομιλίε που έχουν κάνει οι νέοι μα εδώ, να διεκδικούν τα δικιά του και ελπίζω να συνεχίσουν. Εγώ πάντω θα σταθώ στο πλάι του, γιατί έχω παιδιά τη ηλικία του και ξέρω τι σκέφτονται. Και τα παιδιά πράγματι πρέπει να ονειρεύονται. Τα παιδιά τη Κύπρου είναι πολύ καλά μορφωμένα. Οι πιο πολλοί έχουν και δοκτοράτα, έχουν και μάστερ. Είμαστε ένα λαό από του πιο καλά μορφωμένου στον κόσμο. Άρα μα αξίζει αυτό το ανθρώπινο δυναμικό να να το αξιοποιήσουμε στον τόπο μας και να χτίσουμε μαζί ένα καλύτερο μέλλον. Κύριε Παδοπούλε, ευχαριστούμε ιδιαίτερα για τον χρόνο σα για την επίσκεψή σα στο Λοδίνο και καλή συνέχεια σε αυτό το μεγάλο έργο που κάνετε στο Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοβούλιο. Καλή συνέχεια. Σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και σα συγχαίρω γιατί η παρουσία τη ελληνική τηλεόραση εδώ πράγματι δίνει φωνή στη φωνή μα. Σα ευχαριστώ ιδιαίτερα.